So hi everybody, uh, good afternoon and welcome to, to this talk in the ICS village here at DEF CON or there in DEF CON. Uh, this talk is the journey of ICS project files uh, from visibility to forensics and exploitation. And I will explain what this means and what we'll talk about in a minute, but first, uh, who I am. My name is Nadav. I'm the head of the research team at Clouty. Uh, just a bit of background, Clouty is an ICS cybersecurity uh, company. What we do is protect ICS, uh, ICS networks. And this protection is usually based on a deep understanding of the protocols and the, uh, and the assets that exist in such a network. And uh, the job of the research team at Clouty is to do just that, is to investigate uh, different ICS devices, different ICS protocols to understand what uh, a proper behavior is, what something that's a bit different that might be dangerous would look like. And uh, based on this understanding to improve the protection of, uh, of the networks that we, uh, that we protect. Uh, I think that's the main uh, agenda of the Clarity research team. Uh, but not only do we understand how the protocols work, we also usually use this uh, understanding of OT networks and OT environments uh, and leverage it to uh, vulnerability research. So the team basically also uh, plays with the PLCs, plays with the uh, uh, OT software to try and find vulnerabilities. And as you can see here uh, in, the, in the picture in the, in the slide, that's our lab. That's what we call our playground. And basically uh, what we do is we come in the morning and we start playing with PLCs or basically and uh, now in uh, COVID-19 times, we uh, stay at home in the morning and start playing with PLCs. We've actually had to install internet-based uh, switches so that we can uh, power cycle some of the PLCs from away uh, if we did anything that, uh, that uh, caused them to fall for some reason. And, uh, and obviously when we find these vulnerabilities, we will uh, report to vendors. We will have the vendors issue uh, patches and advisories to uh, obviously to our customers and to the public at all. So that's basically uh, my job. My job is to play with PLCs and try to uh, uh, find interesting uh, uh, points security-wise in these PLCs. And here, let's talk about what we're going to say today. So basically, the agenda is uh, ICS project files, the good of them. What are these project files? What do I mean when I say an ICS project file? And what information it may contain and how it may be used for the good? The bad side is, once we've done that and we've understood how these project files work, how they look, we will also try to understand why it may, they may be vulnerable. They may pose some risk to, uh, to the engineer's computer. And uh, lastly, the ugly would be, I would try to convince you that not only these vulnerabilities exist, but they're not only theoretical vulnerabilities, they may be used uh, by an attacker to infect an engineer. So, uh, so basically the, the flow of, the, of this presentation would be uh, exactly the flow that my team and I did when we came to investigate project files. We started off from understanding how these project files work and what information can be found in them so that we can better uh, uh, improve our uh, capability to assist our customers in listing the assets in the network and identifying any uh, potential uh, soft spots in the network. So we started by that. And then when we looked into these project files, as we will do in a few minutes, we started understanding that they may be a, a, a bit risky in how they work. And so we start looking into these vulnerabilities and then uh, we'll go through these vulnerabilities that we, uh, we found. So let's, uh, let's get to it. And I think we best start with what is an ICS project file? Because when I say ICS project file, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. So I think it's best to, to define this uh, file. And, and let's start with uh, what is a, an ICS engineering software. So basically here are a few, just a few screenshots of a very common engineering software that we, we might encounter. <clears throat> and basically when I say ICS project file, what I mean is how this uh, engineering software saves its information. So uh, for example, uh, if you work on uh, uh, configuring a PLC, using uh, the BNR Automation Studio we see here, then the engineer would want at some point to save all the work they've done so that later on they can use it or they can reopen it, they can edit it or anything like that. An ICS project file would be a file, a directory, anything, an entity in which all this information is saved. So when I say ICS project file, it doesn't necessarily mean just one specific file. It means the logical entity in which the ICS uh, software saves all its information. And when that is the definition, you can start thinking and translating it into the information that we expect to find in these project files. Because uh, I want to convince you that these project files are interesting. Don't forget, we, we, we came into this challenge trying to improve our capability to understand networks by uh, uh, looking at these project files. So let's think what information we expect to find in these project files. And 
obviously we'll start from the uh, topmost layer. And I think it makes sense that a project file that describes uh, uh, a plant or a, a manufacturing uh, site or anything like that would have to contain the network layout. So from the topmost layer, we will see the network layout, as you can see here, some screenshots from uh, the step seven engineering station by uh, Siemens or from uh, uh, Rockwell's uh, engineering software. You can see that it holds uh, a list of assets on the, uh, in the network. So for example, here we have a profit bus, bus with a few S7400 stations, and we can use this file to identify that we have uh, uh, four stations along this bus and understand what they are and where, where they are. Next, let's dive into these uh, stations because this project file has to contain information about the specific assets within, within the, the network. And so looking at a specific asset, you can see just a few more screenshots here describing how we may uh, identify all the uh, different slots in the device, on the device. So as you can see here, again, uh, a snapshot from, from Siemens software showing the exact slots and the model and the order number and the firmware for every slot, which is very interesting information. We can see that it also has, has uh, for example, here from BNR, you can also see uh, the serial information, the serial number, or the, uh, or the uh, network addresses. So the information about the hardware of every device in the network is very uh, interesting and, and exists in these project files. <clears throat> but we can also dive even deeper because these uh, engineering software obviously are used to engineer. Uh, and so programming the logic on these devices happens through these softwares and we would expect it to be saved within these project files. And indeed, diving into one specific device, looking into the, the guts of what is saved in this project file would be, uh, would be the actual logic. So again, a few screenshots here, but you can see that these project files will contain the block diagram, the ladder diagram, whatever uh, type of logic we configured, we expect, uh, we expect these project files to, be contain, to, contain, uh, to contain it. So that's going from the topmost layer of the network to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the internals of a specific PLC, the actual logic that every PLC is running. And so I think hopefully that shows you that these project files are useful. They are able to provide us with a full inventory of assets, their details, their models, their uh, firmwares, whatever. And of course, also their logic, right? Which is uh, great for us and great for the engineer uh, to use as backup, uh, which is nice. They're also very easy to collect. The, the advantage with uh, looking into project files, and here again, think of, uh, of me as a, a person wanting to improve the visibility into the network. One alternative for, for, for me could be, for example, to just uh, capture traffic from the network and try to map the network from this traffic. But capturing traffic requires a lot of work. It requires configuring spam ports. It requires waiting for interesting traffic to come. Whereas uh, looking into project files, all it means is that I have to access the file on the engineer's computer or on the backup server because an engineer would probably use some kind of backup server that will hold all these project files in one place, so I don't have to look far. And I have these files at the palm of my hands without having to work uh, too hard. And once I do have these files, all I have to do is just write some kind of script uh, that knows how the, file, how the file is built, and we'll get to it uh, in a few minutes. And once I've done that, I can, within seconds, determine exactly all, the, all those details that I, could, uh, that I showed you uh, just a second ago. Uh, uh, starting from the network and going down to the actual logic. So that's very great. And that allows us to collect a lot of information within a second. But the next question should be, why do I care about this information? So why, did we, why do we mind about the network or about the modern information? And my claim is that the first step in the securing uh, an OT uh, network would be this type of visibility, not only in securing, also in uh, uh, promising the, the continuous operation of such a network, but obviously my perspective and, and DEF CON's perspective is the security side. So let's start with network. Obviously mapping the network is critical to understanding that any new devices connected to the network uh, uh, could be a malicious actor who connected to the network. And obviously on the, other head, on the other side, identifying that a device is missing from the network could be something happened to a device. And so we need to have this full picture before we start uh, diving into the network to identify any changes that might have happened. Next, it also helps us to identify the roles of assets within the network. Because if I have this project file, I can identify that every PLC uh, has a specific responsibility. And so this PLC is, part, is in charge of this part of the, of the process line. And this uh, PLC is in charge of that part. And so when anything, uh, anything uh, we don't expect happens, I will be able to quickly identify, uh, identify what is the root cause of that. 
And also it will help me manage these PLCs and assign uh, people in charge for them, for example, and more. Next, we will have the detailed inventory because as you could see before, we also have the model, we also have the firmware version and that's great uh, uh, for, a, for an engineer or for a security person to assess their security posture because when you know how many uh, devices you have of each model and what firmware they're using, you are able to identify very quickly how, uh, how vulnerable you are to a new vulnerability that might have been published, how, uh, how deep is your backlog in terms of firmware upgrades you need to perform on your devices because you don't want it to be too old uh, or, too, uh, 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 or too vulnerable. So having this, uh, this detailed inventory allows you to know where you're standing and uh, keep yourself up to date with, with, uh, with any new releases by vendors, for example. And lastly, when something does happen, uh, it might be uh, a security event, it might be uh, uh, an, an operational event, but when something does happen, if you do have a snapshot of where the plant was or where the site was yesterday, it's a lot easier to identify what has changed and what might be the root cause of the issue uh, today. And also it's a lot easier to, uh, to start everything up again tomorrow because you know exactly where you are. You can use the configuration files, the, P the, the ICS project files to reconstruct everything very quickly. So you can also identify uh, the cause of the issue and uh, start again, which is uh, great in terms of incident response in the OT industry where downtime is critical. So uh, uh, hopefully, I convinced you that, uh, that this information is critical, that ICS project files hold interesting information and that this information is important. One side note that, that is not the main issue that we speak about uh, in this uh, presentation, uh, it has been spoken of in, in previous presentations, but, uh, but one side note is seeing how these project files contain such valuable information also means that they may, may be used by malicious actors themselves because a malicious actor trying to plan an attack on a, an OT facility may use these information in the project files to plan their attack uh, better, to identify uh, vulnerable devices, to map uh, tags on specific devices that affecting them would affect the, the, the uh, operation of the plant. And so these project files are very interesting uh, from a security perspective, both from, uh, uh, from an operational perspective, both to the OT engineer, but also to the uh, uh, hacker uh, doing their, their recon at, uh, at this stage. So that's just a side note that these project files need to be saved. I, I know that a lot of people like saving their ICS project files on uh, uh, Dropbox uh, folders, etc. That's something to think of and making sure that uh, these uh, shared directories are secure. So ICS project files at this point, and, uh, and hopefully if, if I convinced you uh, that the thought process that we had uh, had convinced you, ICS project files are great. It's a super easy way to get tons of information that we want, which is very nice from, uh, from Clarity's perspective or from my perspective, because, uh, because the things I had to do to, uh, to get all the model information of all the devices in the network before were a lot more complex. And now all I have to do is understand how a project file is built and have the engineer uh, uh, provide me with the project file and I'm able to produce all the information. So that sounds uh, super easy and super great, but is it really? So I think, this question builds up to what, what an ICS project file really looks like. We only discussed, discussed what ICS project files are in theory, but let's talk about what an ICS project file really looks like. What, what, what does it mean when I say ICS project file? <clears throat> Sorry, so the, the most basic use case would be just, just a text file. Uh, you, you may go to the software, you may click uh, export on the software and what you get is just an Excel file that uh, my grandma can, uh, can open with, uh, with her office that we just recently installed for her and understand everything in the network. Uh, so you can see that the, the IP addresses of the devices, the models of the devices, the versions, which is very nice, very easy, very useful. And that's uh, great stuff. It's not very good for me as a researcher because then my boss could fire me if all files look like that, but it's great for my grandma and for the uh, common engineer trying to understand the uh, network format. And obviously, we have many formats, different formats of, uh, of ICS uh, textual project files. So uh, another uh, example for a project file by, uh, by one of Rockwell softwares. And as you can see here, an XML, which is also nice and very uh, script friendly. If you want to write a script uh, that will pass this information, you can see very easily that you can see the name of the bus, you can see the type of the network, you can see the host name of the devices. <clears throat> so for ICS project files being textual, it's really great and we have everything we need for that. But that's not always the case. 
Sometimes, uh, and for example here, this is an ACD file. It's a file generated by the Atlas Logics 5000, uh, the Rockwell uh, software. You can see that while it starts as a textual file, and you might think that your day is, uh, is a good day, uh, within a few lines, uh, this becomes something that is clearly not English. And indeed, uh, this file is uh, most of the information within it, and all of the interesting information is saved in some kind of binary format. And so in this case, my grandma would probably call me and, and ask for help. And, and this help will not be easy. You have to try and understand what this project file looks like. You have maybe to reverse engineer the program, maybe to, uh, to black box and understand, uh, to do some black box research and understand how this uh, project file is built. And indeed, that's what, we, that's what we have to do when we encounter such files. And you see that the Rockwell ACD file is not, is not the only case. This is an example for, for a Siemens device, uh, a, a file outputted by uh, the Dixie 5 software. Uh, and another example uh, by another uh, Rockwell uh, software, an older version of the RS logics. So binary formats are very common as well. And, uh, and in terms of uh, research and understanding how they are built, you have to work a lot harder for that. Still, not only do we have binary formats or textual formats, we also have uh, the cases where a project file is not really a file. It might be a directory. This is, for example, uh, the project file that is generated by the Siemens Step 7 uh, uh, software. And as you can see, it's just a directory containing a lot of subdirectories, containing a lot of other subdirectories, containing a lot of binary files. And so the project file here, the challenge of understanding where the information is, is not only understanding what the binary format is, it's also understanding where the file is. And in this case, we just see a few tens of project files. But, uh, but as you can see here in this, uh, in this uh, one of Mitsubishi's softwares, you can see that we got a directory that's about 7,000 files. So, you have a lot of uh, sifting through the files to do before you can start, uh, you can start working for reals. And, uh, and obviously, sometimes these archives may not be just a zip archive or just a plain directory. It may be a cub, a cub file. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with cub archives. They're a very old format. Uh, what is today has been replaced by zip. And just finding a Python library to un a cub a cub archive is a challenge of itself, even though this, this uh, uh, format is a, a uh, publicly uh, available and everything, just finding a script to uncub the file was a challenge of itself. But obviously, when it comes to directories, most of the files we meet are zipped. And uh, obviously, a zip is just an archive that contains a directory. And uh, what the software does is take the whole uh, directory containing all the information of the project and zip it into uh, a, a single file. And as we'll see in a minute, this file may be saved with a different uh, uh, file extension. So it won't be .zip, it may be .something else. But if you just open it <coughs> and check, you will see that actually, in fact, that's a zip file containing a lot of other uh, types of files. And we'll go into that in, in just a second when, when we show an example. So just to recap, project files provide great information and they come in many, many, many shapes and sizes. Uh, and so we have to work sometimes very hard to collect this, uh, this information. So let's just see. Uh, just one example, another screenshot of the file. This file was generated by uh, uh, Crimson, a software by Red Lion to engineer, to program uh, HMIs. And as you can see, this file, while it's binary and, and not uh, very readable for, for the common user, but you can see just by looking at it, that it does hold some interesting information. For example, if you look here, you can see the model G306. And obviously when we know that this file was used to configure G306, then we can identify that this field shows the model. We still have to work into understanding what, uh, how do I get to this model? What means, uh, what, how do I extract the model from this file? But we see that it has a model. We can also see that there are some numbers here and uh, not sure what they mean. We have uh, the string uh, major, which might be a part of, uh, of the major uh, firmware version or anything like that. And so the research team would have to do uh, a lot of digging and some reverse engineering into understanding what this Crimson file uh, uh, looks like. And the, the, the objective is to turn this file into something that's human readable. So for example, here, as you can see, what we were able to extract from this file is indeed the module and also the IP address. And obviously I can't see, at least with a glance, I can't see the IP address here, but it took some work and some reverse engineering of the software to understand where this IP address is located within the file. <clears throat> we could also identify that this is indeed an HMI and identify the exact uh, version of the Redline Crimson software that was used to generate this file. In this case, these files are, uh, are compressed. So it's uh, uh, one uh, compression method that is uh, uh, pretty specific uh, that was used to save all this information. Once they were uncompressed, we could start and identify exactly 
uh, uh, the interesting fields within this file. So that's one example. Let's think of another example for a project file and, and let's, uh, let's have a look at the, at the way uh, the Siemens step seven saves its files. And as I mentioned before, basically it's a directory. And so when you export uh, uh, from the Siemens step seven, you will get a directory which will use it, usually you, you will zip. And what we get from our customers would be just a zipped file. And this zip extracts into this uh, directory containing many files as you could see before. And looking into these files, what we identified when we tried to find the interesting information is that one of these subdirectories within the SDB subdirectory is the interesting subdirectory, but that contained a lot of files with the names, with the very informative names, uh, 0000a1.pg. So obviously no file here is called, I am the interesting file or uh, model and film or file or anything like that, but rather, uh, these internal names. And so looking into these files, we identified that one of these files contain the interesting information. And just by opening it, you can see, uh, again, some interesting strings hidden within this binary file. So you can see the order number again, you can see the model here. Uh, and so now we've discovered what the file uh, was, what interesting file, what is the interesting file within this directory? we would still have to do a lot of uh, uh, reverse engineering to understand how to extract this information from that. And that basically is the job that we do. We, uh, we commit to uh, being able to understand the project file to extract all this information that uh, we deem interesting in this project file. And when we get a new project file, a new, uh, a new format, a new requirement from a customer, what we will do is we will try to uh, understand how this software works, same as we would do for a protocol, same as we would do for uh, for any type of uh, uh, such request. So just let's, let's do a quick overview of what we see in these project files that we, that we look into. And I think the most common thing that is uh, uh, found in all uh, or in a great percentage of uh, project files uh, in the world, no matter the vendor, no matter the software, is a zip archive. Because usually these projects will contain a lot of uh, different files. Uh, for example, one file will contain the hardware configuration, one file will contain the logic, uh, one file will contain the list of assets, et cetera, et cetera. And the project file is simply, sorry, is simply a zip directory containing all these files. Looking into this project file, and once we've unzipped uh, this project file, we see a lot of files. And what we'll usually see, and what is very common in these files, is first OLE files. OLE is a format used by older Office documents. So it's a format by Microsoft. And it's a very convenient format for, for developers to hold a lot of binary information in different streams. So it's very convenient and we see it in use a lot <coughs> in ICS software. Next, we will see a lot of database files. And uh, this makes sense when you come to think of it because these project files need to contain a lot of information per every device. For example, you will need to contain the firmware, the model, the IP address, et cetera, et cetera. And so it makes sense to save it in a database format. And so we see SQLI databases, MSSQL databases, a lot of uh, uh, database formats. One of these formats, just as a side note, is the Access database, uh, another format by Microsoft that was used by, by Access. And that's, again, a very old format. And actually so old that, again, finding a Python library to, uh, to access such a database, uh, we couldn't do it. We, we simply couldn't find a Python native library. Uh, that, that could access uh, could access the access database. And so just a few weeks ago, we, we published our open source tool, uh, open source Python library to uh, interpret access databases, uh, which is nice. Now you can do it just by, uh, by importing in Python. Um, next, we will also see a lot of proprietary binary format. As I mentioned before, no one forces the vendor to, to work with a specific database or anything like that. So the vendor might decide, might decide that they want to save the, the information in their own proprietary format. And they will design this format. They will write the code to, uh, to access this format and to uh, parse this format, the information in there, and to obviously to save uh, the information into this file. And so we see a lot of proprietary binary formats. Lastly, as I mentioned before, if you're really lucky from, a, from a, a, an engineer's perspective, if you're really lucky, you will get a text file you can open and just review the text file and understand everything. Obviously, from the researcher's perspective, it's less fun uh, because all you have to do is open the text file. But, uh, but in my perspective, uh, still, this is very convenient and a very good way uh, to save uh, the information. <clears throat> so all that means that if we, if we take a look back at what we discussed so far about what project files do, what information they contain, how they are built, then we can think of a few traits that, that are recurring. Uh, first is we see a lot of binary formats that are, that are developed internally. 
Uh, and as I mentioned just a second ago, this is because the vendors will, will develop their own code and they will do that by themselves. Next, we will see that if, if, the, if the format is proprietary or if it's public or if it's a database or anything like that, still a complex parsing is required in order to extract the information from this file or to save the information to this file. Because we're talking about a, a, a very big amount of information in various types. You sometimes want to save the IP address. You sometimes want to save the compiled logic. So various types. And ob obviously, always, it would require some complex uh, parsing work. Lastly, it will hold some proprietary information. Every vendor will save their own information. Every vendor will design the file as they wish to uh, save the information that they were looking for. So we will see a lot of proprietary information in proprietary formats that will be complex. And thinking of all these uh, three traits, it sounds quite familiar, or at least uh, to a researcher working in the ICS domain, it sounds quite familiar. It sounds quite familiar because these traits are very common in ICS protocols as well. And so when we, uh, when we uh, uh, had reviewed enough ICS project files to extract the information from them, and at, at some point we had a nice collection of ICS project files uh, formats that we support and understand, we started to think ICS protocols. And the next thought as a security researcher, when you think of ICS protocols, the next thought is OI. And the reason for that is obviously that vulnerabilities in ICS protocols exist and exist a lot. And, and they are published weekly and these devices are very vulnerable. And, and the reason for that is that this code was usually developed with no secure security in mind. And so when you're thinking of something that is comparable to ICS protocols, your next thought would be, Let's check how secure this may be. And indeed, just a quick, a quick Google of, uh, of ICS project file vulnerabilities showed us that not very. The answer is not very. And so just a quick Google, and you can see a, a lot of uh, vulnerabilities that have been published in, in, the, in, the recent, uh, in recent years. And, uh, and just a quick uh, look up in the ICS CERT website, for example, for advisories published recently, you can see you can see here one type of uh, vulnerability that's an SQL injection. Another is a use after free. Another is a stack buffer uh, overflow. Uh, and so vulnerabilities are constantly published on these devices. And all these vulnerabilities, as you can see, are, uh, are relevant to, uh, to ICS project files. And so these, uh, these formats, these files are vulnerable. Not only they are vulnerable, they're also growing uh, in terms of awareness to their vulnerabilities. So just a quick example for that, we can have a look at the vulnerability that was published in 2016, uh, just four years ago. And this vulnerability, uh, and I put here the CV, is crashing the engineering software with a malicious project. This means that if the engineer would double click on a malicious project, the engineering software would crash. And, and that, that vulnerability got at, at the time a CVSS score of 4.2, which is a low CVSS score. And not only that, the advisory contains this, uh, some kind of disclaimer sentence saying these vulnerabilities are not exploitable remotely and cannot be exploited without user interaction. So that's some kind of disclaimer saying, yes, this is a vulnerability, but no, it's not very, very interesting, or at least not at this time. And the reason I'm saying at this time is because we can look at the same vulnerability or, or a similar vulnerability published in 2019. Again, a vulnerability that means that when you open an, an, a, a project file, when you double click a project file, the engineering station, the engineering software would crash. And so the meaning of the vulnerability uh, uh, is the same. But this time, and we're uh, three years ahead, it got a CVSS score of 7.8, which is a high CVSS score, and no disclaimer in this case at all. So there is some kind of growing understanding that these vulnerabilities, while they are not as, as, as sexy as protocol vulnerabilities, they are not as accessible as network vulnerabilities, they are interesting and they are dangerous. Another example for the growing security focus is the Pond to One competition that was held in Miami this year. So Pond to One is an organization of competitions that invite hackers to, uh, to compete on, specific, uh, uh, on finding specific vulnerabilities in specific devices. For example, find a, a, a remote code execution in a, a Tesla car. If you do, you get a lot of money for that. And so the first one-to-one -one competition that was targeted uh, uh, on ICS products was held in the, just in the beginning of this year. And it had uh, five categories, and one of which was finding uh, uh, vulnerabilities in ICS project files. And so uh, even an organization uh, like that, which is very oriented towards security and very uh, up to date in terms of understanding the security world, sets one of the categories in their competition as vulnerabilities in ICS project files. And not only that, the winner in this category would win $20,000. So the motivation is 
<coughs> is not only interest, but also uh, uh, gaining a lot of money. And, and by the way, there was a, a winner in this category. Someone collected this prize. And, uh, and, there was, and this category also held a, a, a product by Schneider as well, <coughs> which we also collected the prize for. So I think at this point, what we can say is that project files are great for asset management. They are very interesting. The information they hold are very interesting and uh, valuable to uh, an engineer and to the security uh, of this network. They're also great for researchers' employment. Uh, and what do I mean by that? My job is based on the fact that these project files are complex. If, uh, if anyone could just open a project file and uh, 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 extract the data from it, my day would be a lot less interesting. And so they're great for me. Uh, but uh, also they might be great for an attacker, not only for recon purposes, for mapping the network, as we mentioned before, but also because they are vulnerable. And what I would want to show you is that they're vulnerable, not just in theory. So we saw that the work vulnerabilities published, but let's uh, do a quick overview of these parts uh, that we saw before uh, uh, that comprise an ICS, a common ICS project file. And as, as you can remember, we discussed the zip file, we discussed OLE files, etc. And let's take it step by step. And I will show you that in just in the recent months, vulnerabilities have been published for every part of this uh, project file. So let's uh, think of it uh, step by step. And we started off with uh, zip. And what I wanted to show for, for zip uh, uh, files is the very common zip slip vulnerability. And so what this actually means is there is no sanitation on zip paths, but let's explain what this means uh, in a more technical way. So let's have a look at what, a zip, uh, at what the header of a zip file looks like. So take it in for a second, I'll have a drink. Okay, great. So as you can see, <clears throat> as you can see, a zip file holds a lot of different files within it, right? When you double click a zip file, it ex extracts into multiple files and multiple directories. And the way the, the file is saved on, in, in, for real uh, in its binary data is that its header contains the list of files to which we need to extract the information. So for example, this file will extract the information to a, a directory called example slash UX. And another file will be extracted to Example, fi example slash uh, file one.txt. And another file will be extracted to example slash file with a long name.sql. So when you double click this file, you will get a new directory called example, and within it, you will get three files. And that makes sense, and that's just how the zip, uh, the zip file header works. But this also means that, uh, that if not properly handled, an attacker may use these, uh, these attributes of a zip file. And how they may use it? they may employ the, uh, the special characters that allow directory traversal because this slash dot dot slash means go up one directory. And so instead of saving the file within the example directory, this will cause uh, the, the software that extracts this file to save this, directory, to save this file somewhere on outside of the, uh, of the uh, targeted directory. And so we may write files basically to any location we want on the, on the computer on which this file is extracted. And this is a very common vulnerability. It has been known for years. It has been handled in, in many uh, uh, products. But what we see in the ICS domain, unfortunately still, is that some products still do, uh, do not sanitize the paths and do not make sure that there is no use of these characters and allow an attacker to uh, employ this vulnerability and save files basically to any location they want on the uh, target computer. And saving files on any location sometimes would directly mean being able to take control of the computer because you may override some files, you may save files, for example, like, like we did here, <clears throat> you may save files to the startup directory and save in destroyer.exe. And that's obviously not something we want. So that's just a very, very basic vulnerability in zip files that is still uh, very, very common and uh, may happen if the product does not make sure that the paths within the zip file header are valid. So that's zip files. But uh, we, let's take a step in and I'll just show uh, a couple of vulnerabilities that were published just in the recent months in these uh, uh, exact uh, things. This path reversal CWE means exactly that, means that uh, someone could use this, uh, this attribute. And as you can see here, just, uh, just in the past, uh, during the past uh, year, uh, several vulnerabilities have been published in this exact uh, method. So that's a zip file. Now let's have a look at the OLE files that we mentioned that are very common within zip files. And here I will not go into uh, a lot of details, but as I mentioned before, 
OLE files are the files used by Office products. And, <coughs> sorry, and old Office products. And old Office products, we all know that have been uh, vulnerable uh, for years, right? You would not open an email saying, hey, please download and open this uh, Word document uh, I sent you uh, from someone you don't know, because you know that this could be dangerous. And still, a document from the FBI showed that the, the most common used vulnerabilities still today in 2020 are, uh, I think, five of the 10 most common used vulnerabilities in, in real life are still vulnerabilities in Office, uh, office uh, files. And so OLE files, vulnerable. It doesn't matter if you wrap it with Office or wrap it with an ICS engineering software. They are vulnerable. That's OLE files. Next, let's discuss uh, databases. And when you think of database and you're a security researcher, the next thing you, 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 that comes to your mind is SQL injection. That's again, a very, very common vulnerability in the handling of SQL queries uh, when, uh, when, uh, when working with databases. And uh, it's very common in the world and specifically in ICS software, it still exists. It may exist if the, uh, if the software uses a database to save its information. So let's take just a few, just, a, just one example for a vulnerability that was discovered in, uh, as part of the Pont1 competition by, uh, by Uri from, uh, from my team. And what, uh, uh, sorry, by, uh, by Amir and Sharon from my team. And what they discovered was that uh, uh, one, of the, one of these products saves the information within a database. And if you save, uh, and this database holds the version in which the uh, information was saved. So if you change the version field uh, to a lower version, then when the software opens this database, it will run some migration scripts on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the file. And what we found was that you could use uh, uh, one type of SQL injection in these parts and uh, uh, create a full remote code execution just based on uh, an SQL injection in the database. And what it looks like is, as you can see here, the engineer would double click the project file, the engineering software would open and within a second, uh, <clears throat> and within a second we will see a notepad pop up. And in this case, notepad, but in a malicious case, it will not be Notepad. It will be some kind of software that might cause damage. So that's databases. Let's go on to binary formats. And obviously, binary formats are risky because they mean that someone had to write a lot of code. Someone had to design a, a, a format that would be uh, secure enough. And all this, uh, all this work has been done usually uh, years ago uh, when no one was, uh, was uh, security oriented. And so vulnerabilities in public in, in, uh, in binary formats exist and exist a lot. And we see a lot of them published uh, on a monthly basis. And so I, I won't go into details in this case because, because simply you can understand that the complexity of a binary format means that many vulnerabilities may be found within that. Uh, for example, just one example here, uh, this, uh, this article by, uh, by Ed Kovacs from Security Week is reviewing a vulnerability published in the Red Lion HMI uh, files that we saw before. So those compressed files, uh, those crimson compressed files uh, we saw before, we saw earlier, are vulnerable to some vulnerabilities that were discovered by, uh, <coughs> by, uh, by uh, security researchers and, and were published uh, before. So that's binary formats. Lastly, we said that if you're really lucky, you would have a text file. And, and, and one may think that a text file, how hard can it be? What can be vulnerable within a text file? and still a vulnerability published uh, by Uri from, from my team uh, just a few months ago in, uh, in uh, one of Siemens's products showed that the parsing of a textual file uh, within the software may have caused a, a, a remote code execution. So again, you would double click uh, and the project file and uh, code would be executed. And, and that's even though this file was uh, just a textual format, the bug was obviously in the parsing of this file. So what we, what we could see is that Taking apart the common ICS project file, you can understand that uh, uh, every part of it may be vulnerable. And basically what I want to convince you is these vulnerabilities may exist. They are not something that is out of the ordinary. So let's take one uh, type of project files, and this would be uh, a project file used by, uh, by Phoenix Contact Software, PLC Next. And let's see exactly how this vulnerability works, just so, uh, so we can get the hang of how this vulnerability works. Uh, and so this vulnerability uh, was discovered by, uh, by Amir, uh, Amir uh, from my team. And, uh, and this vulnerability allows remote code execution when a project is uh, uh, opened in the PLC Next uh, uh, software by, by Phoenix Contact. Let's understand how it works. So 
First of all, this is the software. This is just a screenshot of the software. As you can see, it holds some information. It shows uh, all the information about the HMI, the PLC, etc. And this is just how the software looks like. But let's see how the information is saved behind the scenes. And indeed, in this, in this case, the information is saved in a PCWEX file. And as I mentioned before, the PCWEX file is actually just a zip file uh, with a different extension. And so if you extract it, you can see that there are a few files within, with, within this file. And one of the files that was of interest for us is the project.proj file. And why is that? The reason for that is that this file is just an XML, a textual file. But as you can see here, it contains an import line that imports a, a, a file from a specified location. And so uh, what you would do is you would, uh, this, uh, this uh, line here contains basically a pointer to another file. Uh, and this file will be loaded when the, uh, when the project starts, or will be accessed when the, when the project is loaded. And the, the, this file that is pointed to here would be the targets file. And this targets file, again, is a textual file, but as you can see here now, it gets interesting because it contains the names of some DLLs that need to be loaded when the project is built. And so what we discovered was that basically when you open a project file, you, uh, when you open a project file, this whole chain of events happens, and if you want to be uh, to think of it from a malicious actor's uh, point of view, what you would want to do is to be able to send a malicious PCWEX file and get uh, the, uh, the engineer to open it. And you would change the pointer here to uh, anything you want, basically any other file you want. And, uh, and let this other targets file contain a pointer to your malicious DLL. And let's see what it looks like in real life. So we start again with the same directory structure because we only change a, a bits of lines within the files. And within the project file, we changed it instead of uh, using some kind of environment variable, we'll simply point it to a, a malicious SMB server that is accessible to the, to the victim's uh, machine. So we don't have to drop this file ahead on the victim's machine. All we have to do is make the victim's machine approach us and request for the malicious targets file. And within the targets file, again, what we would do is we would point, point to a malicious DLL that is used, uh, uh, that is loaded when the pro project is built. And so what happens basically when the project is open, that the software is automatically building the project. And so they access this project file, this project.proj file, and collect the malicious.targets file from our server. And based on this malicious.targets file, they will collect the DLL again from our server and execute it. And once they've done that, basically we ran our own DLL on the remote uh, machine with uh, the permissions of the software and we've uh, taken over the uh, control. And that's the whole vulnerability. And that's uh, uh, pretty cool in my opinion. Uh, and obviously this vulnerability was disclosed to Phoenix and we would like to, uh, to acknowledge their uh, quick remediation of that. It took, I think less than two months between the time uh, we disclosed this vulnerability to Phoenix and uh, the time they released a fixed version and a divisory, uh, which is very nice and not very common in the ICS domain. Uh, so uh, uh, we would like to thank uh, Phoenix uh, for fixing this in, in such a hurry. Cool, so what did we do so far? We showed that the, those project files are interesting and we showed that they are vulnerable. We showed that you can find vulnerabilities in them and some of these vulnerabilities you don't even ha have to work very hard in order to explain. So let's uh, 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 complete the last part, piece of the puzzle. The last piece of the puzzle would be how I can use these vulnerabilities in order to take over a, 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 an engineer's computer because if you think of a protocol vulnerability, you know that the PLC is there, you know that you are here. All you have to do is communicate with the PLC and you're done. But in the case of a project file, you know that the engineer is here, you know that you are here, but you want to get the engineer to open a project file of your own. So the attack vector here is something that I need to convince you that exists. So we had a look and, uh, and we tried to think what ways, uh, what ways uh, could be used to get a, a, a victim engineer to open a, an ICS project file. Because you know that when someone sends you a, a doc file, as I mentioned before, via email, someone you don't know, you will probably be suspicious about it and, and not do anything without, with that. But if you're an OT engineer and they send you a, a Rockwell ACD file or any other type of, a, of ICS engineering file, then you might be curious. This is uh, your world, you're interested, you want to understand what's going on, you will want to open this file, you will be curious. So uh, instead of sending you a doc file, in theory, the malicious actor could send you a, a, a an ACD file or a project file and get you to open that. It would be more likely that you do. And this type of phishing campaigns happens in the COVID-19 world. 
you know that, uh, and, and many, uh, and many uh, papers have been published on that, that the fact that uh, fishing is on the rise and targeted uh, fishing towards ICS industries is on the rise. So as you can see here, this may be used uh, uh, as a fishing campaign that is very targeted and very specific tools towards uh, OT engineers. Sorry, and not only uh, phishing campaigns or not only phishing campaigns via email. What we, what we thought next was let's check the forums, the support forums uh, in the ICS domain, because we know these uh, support forums are very, very, uh, in, in very, very common use. And many people use them to ask questions, to, to, uh, to help other people um, to get some support, both the vendors own forums and uh, the public forums. So we had a look at these forums and we looked for, uh, for people who might have posted these project files and, and had a look at what, what they have done. And so, for example, this is just a one message from the forum that we found. I have an ACD file, but I do not have the software to, uh, to read the controller tags. Can anyone please help me convert this file into a PDF? And they published with this message, they published an ACD file. And what you could see in the comments section is that many, many people did download this file and did open this file and help this person. And obviously, this was uh, the happy case where someone did need help and many people did help him. But if this was, a malicious case, then this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, question could have uh, caught many ICS engineers and, uh, and have taken control over the computer if this was a malicious case. So this attack vector uh, of getting an ICS engineer to open a project file, I think may happen. It's really uh, real, either in, as part of a phishing campaign or as part of a forum uh, requests or anything like that. And the reason this is very critical and more critical than using just a, a, a doc file is that this engineer who is sent a, a <coughs> who is sent an ICS project file via email from the internet, they will open it on their computer. And this computer, you know that this computer by definition has access to the shop floor, has access to the actual physical devices. Whereas if this was just a, a, a Microsoft Word document, this engineer might have opened it on their own private computer, which is uh, uh, not connected to anything interesting. But if you provide the engineer with the uh, project file, they would take it to the computer that is connected to the shop floor because it has the engineering station and uh, the engineering software installed on it. So basically the hacker with just one step got access not only to uh, an engineer's computer, but to the actual critical engineer computer and to the actual critical network. And so hopefully what I could uh, convince you with uh, along this talk was that ICS project files, they are very interesting. They allow you great visibility into your network and great understanding of your network. And so I don't want anyone to go home and delete all your project files, right? Because you have to keep working and this may provide you of great value if you handle these files right. Obviously you also have to secure your files to make sure that no malicious actor gains access to those files as well. But they are very important. But on the other side, you have to be aware that these project files can be just as malicious as a doc file. And this means that you don't want to open uh, any ICS project file that is uploaded to, uh, to a support forum or to anything like that. And actually, these files may be even more dangerous than these uh, doc files because what we said just a minute ago, that they will provide the attacker with access directly to the critical network. So these files for an attacker actually are a great way to spread through phishing campaigns that are targeted, that are going directly to the ICS engineer and not just to anywhere around the world. And so they're very critical in that. And uh, uh, they will get this attacker a foothold in the ICS network. And so the bottom line here of this talk is just use these ICS project files to gain visibility into your network. And that is great, but be suspicious of any, uh, of any ICS project file that might have been sent to you and that might, be, uh, uh, that might pose risk to your network. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, have a great uh, conference. <laughs>